Welcome to the tutorial creating basic effects part 2. So in this tutorial I'm going to toggle back and forth between animate and animate pro to show you the remaining effects that we haven't seen yet such as the glow, the color scale, some of the motion blurs etc. So the scene that I'm using is actually a modified version of the sample material from pack 13. So in pack 13 we looked at how to create animation paths and this is animation paths part 2. I just got rid of all the foreground stuff the dojo, the balcony, the karate rabbit, to make this scene simpler. So in that sample material, what we did is this. We created, a, we actually didn't have this fourth bird here, but we created a path for the birds to follow and we actually modified the path so it wasn't um, moving at a constant speed, but actually slowed into the drop and then swooped across uh, quickly out of their flight. Some other modifications that I made to this scene is that I actually created a single bird, which I believe is out of the camera frame. There we go. So I created a single bird that does exactly the same thing. Um, and instead of having the keyframes on a peg, like they are with these birds, so the motion is on this peg and all of these birds are linked to this peg, I put the motion path on the drawing uh, itself and that's because for the effects that I'm going to show you the motion um, blur and the directional blur it actually works better in animate if you have the keyframes directly on the drawing so it's really easy to transfer them uh, well especially if it's um, a simple movement like this uh, what I basically did is I, I copied the first bird uh, from this group here the one that's yellow um, by duplicating the layer and dragging it out of the peg group. And then I scaled it and positioned it using the transform tool without the animate button on so that it didn't record as a keyframe. Uh, and then afterwards, what I did is I used the data view uh, to view the position information uh, for this peg and I copied the keyframes onto this layer using the keyframe, add keyframe buttons at exactly the same uh, keyframe positions. And then I actually went into the function editor uh, for this for this group by clicking on the this function button beside the x-axis and mimicking the exact same curve uh, that exists for the peg layer for the bird peg group. So that's exactly how I did it. And if you don't understand what I just said, I'll try to provide this sample scene for you so that you can at least examine uh, the, de the data view and the function editor to, to get an idea of how to do that yourself if need be. Um, so let's get back to the effects part of this tutorial. The first effect I'm going to add is a motion blur. So once again, I'm going to do that from uh, the timeline by going to the add layers button and selecting Effect Motion Blur. And once again, it's been added here to the bottom. The strange thing or interesting thing about the motion blur is that it comes with a mask, but in fact, you don't need to use the mask. You really only need to hook one copy of uh, the drawing that you'd like to perform the effect on to the motion blur. So let's grab bird number four here and drag and drop it over the motion blur. And of course you can't see it as of yet because we're not in the render mode. Um, so I'm going to drag this across. So the important thing to know when hooking a, a drawing object to the motion blur in Animate is that it has to be moving, of course, otherwise you won't see any type of a motion blur. And once again, I'll repeat, these keyframes and interpolation should be on the drawings themselves and not on a peg. So let's go into the render view mode. And you can see this blur uh, occurring. I'm just going to switch tools so we don't see that bounding box. And if I scroll across even further, you see that swoop across, which is a, a really cool kind of uh, effect to see. Uh, but you might say, well, you, can, you can't even see the bird at this point. Well, there is a way around that. You can make a copy of your drawing object. So if I duplicate the selected layer, which is the bird, I drag it out so that's no longer part of the motion blur group. You now have a solid copy of your drawing object uh, over the effect. So 
it's up to you. Sometimes people want the effect to be really just the blur, that this is moving so fast you can't even see a solid version of the object. Uh, another thing you can do is play with the uh, properties of the motion blur, of course. Um, I'll refer you to the user guide to get into some of these properties um, in more detail. Uh, they're pretty obvious though, the number of frames in the trail, so there's 10, which means that uh, it's taking this motion from 10 frames back. That's why it only comes up to here, because this is where the bird was 10 frames ago. The number of samples, so the more samples you have, the more smooth this blur effect looks. Uh, the falloff rate has something to do with how um, transparent the gradient is between um, throughout the blur. So let's try to change that to 0 and 1. I think that's what makes the big difference. So you can see it's more solid here in the back and then sort of faded close to the front. And then if you add 1, you see now it became less solid and uh, still pretty transparent here. And then I think if we went to 2, even more so. So it seems like the higher the falloff rate, the less solid it is at frame 10 back there. Uh, the intensity I'm pretty sure has to do with the opacity. Zero intensity means it's completely transparent. One allows you to actually see it appear. And I'm not sure if it's decimal values in between or if it goes past one. We can try that so we can see that. Does this make a difference? So once again, you can play around, but if you refer to the user guide, um, it'll actually tell you what the, the value scale is as well, uh, so you don't have to guess. Okay, so let's close that. Uh, and now let's look at the second type of blur, which is a directional blur. So I'm just going to hide that from view. Um, we still have this copy of our bird here. And I'm going to go once again to the Add Layer button and select Effect Directional Blur. And once again, it's here at the bottom. So the directional blur does not have a mat, as you might realize. And what I'm going to do is hook this bird onto the directional blur, scroll back a bit, uh, and then go into the render view mode. So unlike the motion blur, the properties to the directional blur haven't been set yet. Uh, everything's at zero, which is why we don't see anything in the camera view. So let's double click on the directional blur to bring up its layer properties. Um, and let's change some of these properties around so that we can start seeing something in the camera view. So let's increase the radius. Okay. Uh, you need it to be something pretty high, so let's go uh, to at least 28 here. So you're starting to see the blur uh, appearing there. Okay, let's stop at 38. So you get the picture that it's coming from behind and it's coming in the direction uh, that we're going to set using the angle and the direction of the trail. Uh, so right now the angle is zero, which is why it's coming exactly behind, but we can change it, for example, to 45 degrees. So you can see it's angled downwards. You can decide if you want the blur to come from north, east, south, or west. So let's try west. So you see it's coming from behind again, the same as if we had had angle zero, so, or you can keep it exactly where the angle was. Um, you can ignore the alpha, which would get rid of the solid version of your image. You can make it less blurry, so it's actually quite a bit clear with a bit of a smear, um, etc. You can change the fall off rate once again, so that it goes from solid to almost transparent instead of uh, solid to solid, like that. Uh, so you can change all sorts of things here in the layer properties. Uh, these are one of those effects that you would probably want to animate over time. Uh, for example, if we keep this going at west, it's going the right way. Uh, actually, since the bird drops down, it's not going the right way. It would probably be something more like north uh, as it drops down. And then as it sweeps across, so more over here, this looks wrong because it should be behind. And now it should be something like west. So this is the type of effect that you probably want to animate over time so that the blur follows properly. So the next thing I'd like to show you how to do is how to add a color scale. And that has nothing at all to do with blurs or motion blurs. But what we're going to do here is use the color scale to create an ambient effect. So make it look like the sun is setting, for example. So the sky will go from blue to pink. So to add a color scale, once again, you can go from the Add Layer button in the timeline, or I haven't been using it very often, uh, but you can go to the top menu and select Insert, Effects, 
color scale. And I mentioned at one point that you can add a background in two ways. You can add a color card or you can physically draw a rectangle and fill it in with a gradient or a fill and make that your sky. And there are advantages and disadvantages to both. Uh, definitely when you're doing 3D uh, scene setup, it's better to use a color card because no matter what angle you use, you'll always see that color behind. Uh, but for something like this, it's convenient to already have a rectangular background because now we can add the color scale to it, which is not something you can do with a color card. So what I'm going to do is take the sky and hook it onto the color scale. And then I'm going to open the color scales properties in the data view like that. And the color scale is another one you probably want to animate over time. So I'm going to go to the first frame and put a keyframe there and go to the last frame and put a keyframe there. And then start changing some of the values. You can do this here in the data view or you can double click on the color scale and they're all here uh, as well. So I'm going to go into the render mode so we can see the changes as we make them. So zero is the lowest value that you could have for any of the color channels. So that would be zero green, zero blue, or zero red. Two is the largest value that you could have and that would bring you to 255. Um, and any value in between zero or two, including a decimal value, will give you a mix between those three colors. Uh, and the zero to two scale also works for the other parameters such as uh, the alpha or the saturation. I might take down the saturation a bit. So something like that. But right now it looks like as the sky, uh, I think I kind of messed up here, I did it on the first keyframe instead of the last keyframe, so it's going to go from pink to blue. I'll just leave it like that so it's like the sun is rising and it goes to a clear day. Like this. Um, but you notice that it doesn't really look natural because these mountains remain blue instead of being affected by the light of a sunset. Uh, so there's something you can do about that as well. You can actually take this entire sky color scene and move it in the top view so that it sits in front uh, like a flat piece of paper and then give it a blending effect like a multiply and it'll actually affect everything beneath in the layer stack, such as the mountains and the bird, and um, put that pink hue over everything. So let's do that by going to the top view. So this is our sky right here. We're going to use the translate tool. And if we pull this forward, this right here I believe is the bird, so we want to bring it in front of the bird as well, so it's in front of everything. And then if we go into the add layer properties and use the blending effect which we've already learned about and if we hook the color scale with this guy to the blending effect and then change this blend mode to multiply you can see that it's touching upon the mountains here but what we do need also which I totally forgot about is we also need a background Otherwise, uh, this will multiply all the way through and there's nothing behind. So the way to resolve that is to make a copy of your sky by duplicating the selected layer, pulling it out so it's on its own, and then moving that back here. So now you have at least something for the multiplied um, screen here in the front to touch upon when it hits the back layer. So this is still blue, but because this front layer here is pink with a blending effect, then as the color scale goes, it'll affect everything um, in its view until it gets to blue like that. And let's do a render of that so you can see what that looks like. Let's play that. It goes from pink to blue. Okay, so now let's go to Anime Pro to take a look at the motion blur, directional blur, and color scale effect there. Okay, so I set up the same scene in Animate Pro. 
Um, so I'll play it for you quickly so you can take a look at that. So of course instead of setting up the effect through the timeline view, we're going to do it through the network view in Animate Pro. So let's look for our blur directional and our motion blur. And I think our bird number four is hiding over here. So setting up this effect is pretty similar to setting up most of the effects you've seen so far. So we'll start with the motion blur just as we did in uh, Animate. Um, and I'm going to hold down Alt and drag the uh, effect across so that uh, the bird is going through the correct port. And you'll notice that there is in fact also a port for a mat. Um, and just like with Animate, you don't really need to use your mat. You can just have uh, your bird plugged in, which is rare because usually if you do see a port format, usually it's not optional um, and it's required, but in this case, it is not. Um, once again, you can also plug a copy of your object directly into the composite uh, before the effect so that there's a solid version of the drawing object as well as the blur. Um, and you can of course tailor the layer properties for the motion blur by clicking on this yellow box and doing exactly what we did uh, in Animate, uh, changing the fall off rate, um, changing the number of uh, frames from by which it trails, etc. Um, on the layer properties panel. And the directional blur acts exactly in the same way as well. So I'm just going to unhook some of this stuff. You can always click on a cable so you can see where it's attached in the composite. So we'll get rid of that. Oops. We don't need it in the sky. Um, let's go into the blur directional parameters because once again they are set to zero, which uh, we know is not useful in seeing an effect uh, appear in the camera view. So you get the picture. So once again, it's really just um, dragging those effects across using the alt across the cable and uh, manipulating the parameters. So now let's take a look at the color scale which is also in the filter group, I believe. So it's right here. And we're gonna put that on our sky, of course. But we also want a different version of our sky behind without the color scale. So in the timeline view, because we want to animate this over time once again, we're going to add a keyframe. This time I'll try to do it correctly here. We'll add a keyframe here for the color scale. This time I'll stay on the last frame. Um, I'm going to open up the data view and we're going to start changing some of these values. There we go. Uh, so it should slide back and forth between the two colors. Uh, now what we want to do is add a blending effect on this color scale. And we're going to hook it in just underneath the color scale and change the blend mode to multiply. And now we are at the place where we need to have a copy of the sky, uh, specifically the copy that's attached to the color scale and the blending mode, uh, appear in front of all the other drawing elements in the scene, while the other sky that has nothing going on, that has no color scale and no blending, so no effects applied to it, has to remain behind. And if you remember from one of the previous tutorials, I taught you about the apply peg transformation which is handy when you need to change the position between uh, 
two copies of the same element. So let's slide that in above the color scale. There we go. And of course we need to add some type of position information to this, so we also need a peg. And then let's go to the peg properties. So what we need to do is change the z-axis for the peg. We need to bring it forward. But I'm not even sure by how much. Let's get a copy of the top view. So this looks like it's our original sky, the one that's black, and the highlighted yellow sky is the one that's being moved forward. So that isn't very much, and we need to move it past the bird, which is here. So it's a jump quite a bit. Uh, so let's try 8 forward. Okay, that's not bad. Well, it's definitely making the mountains pink, which is good. So maybe we'll make it 9 just to be safe. And there we go. So now when we make a render of this scene, let's see what that looks like. Okay, so if we hit the play button, it's kind of nice because you can even see the pink acting on the bird quite a bit here as well. You can tell it has a little bit of uh, pink tones reflected off its surface as well, where it's here it's quite uh, apparent that it's a separate element from the blue sky. Okay, so now that we're done with those effects, let's go back to animate um, and open a new scene once again. And this time in this scene, what I'd like to show you is how to add a glow, how to use the color override effect, and how to change the brightness and contrast. So uh, this is the traditional animation scene that was drawn. It's a big fighting cloud with some stars, carrots, and fists uh, being thrown from the cloud. And it was, of course, all done and drawn by hand. Uh, the only two layers that I eliminated from the sample material are the rough layers uh, for the fighting cloud and for the stars, carrots, and fists. So the first effect we're going to look at is a glow. So let's add a glow to our timeline by going to add new layer effects glow. Then let's take the stars, carrots, and fists and drag this layer to the bottom of the timeline and drag and drop it over the glow. So now it's attached to the glow. Um, and then if we scroll across in the render mode, we can see that there's this uh, transparent golden color that appears. Uh, but once again, these are one of the types of effects that needs uh, the original layer uh, present if you want to see a solid version with the glow on top. So what we can do is duplicate this layer and uh, pull it out of the effects group. And now you can see that the glow uh, appears on top of the carrots uh, and stars and fists. And you can actually obviously change the parameters of the glow as well. You can change the color. so that it looks more golden or glowy. Uh, you know, you can do all sorts of things until it looks as bright or as subtle as you would like the effect to look. So that's the glow effect. 
Um, the next effect I'd like to show you is how to use a color override, and this is a really powerful effect. So I'm going to actually get rid of, or I'll just hide for the instance, uh, the glow effect. So we just have a copy of the stars, carrots, and fists up here uh, with no effect attached. Um, and we're going to add the color override effect by going to effects, color override. And I presume it's at the bottom, yes, once again. So let's take this time, our fighting cloud, and then drag it to the bottom of the timeline stack and drop it over the color override. And then let's double click on the color override to bring up the layer properties. And it's quite a big uh, property box because it is such a powerful effect. Um, so let me go over some of the parts in this effect real quick, or in this layer properties panel. Um, here you have the different palettes that exist in your scene. So if we look at the color palette here, we have the dojo palette, the rabbit palette, the rabbit knight, and the fighting cloud. Um, so that's that makes sense. And as you scroll, or as you select the different palettes, you can see the colors that exist within these palettes down here in the color section. If you'd like to bring in a palette that exists in your project but you can't see in this list, you can use this palette button to search for it and it might be at a different level, uh, environment, job, element, or scene. Um, and if you remember the back end of your animate project, you have these folders that exist and uh, if you go back to the color videos that we did, you'll see that you can save palettes in these different levels. However, if you'd like to import a palette that does not belong in this scene, uh, you can click on this folder button and search for it. So for example, if I'm in the Gathering Content folder, if I go to the palette library, I don't know if you remember that we created text at a certain point and it had some fiery colors. So if I open that and I click on the text button, you'll see the colors that we created. So it's good to know that you can also import other palettes. So the other three sections that exist are on the right side here. Um, there's the palette override. The palette override works best when you want a cloned palette to be considered the palette you'd like to render for that scene. So the best example we have here is the rabbit and the rabbit knight. We created a cloned palette that gives the rabbit all these dark shaded colors if we did a dark shaded scene. Because the software will never render these colors, it will always except the rabbit's palette as the colors that should be rendered for a scene, unless we put the rabbit knight palette here in the palette override section. And we also have to attach the rabbit to the color override layer in the timeline view. So let's do that. Let's take our karate master, let's make him appear. He's really, he's kind of far away, sort of hard to see, but let's bring him down and let's parent him to the color override. And let me uh, hide the fighting cloud. And so you can see here he looks dark. And if we eliminate this, he looks light again because the software is considering this his main palette. So that's a use for the palette override. So the color override uh, has several neat features as well. Uh, let's use the fill for the fighting cloud as an example. So I'm going to drag and drop that in this section. And then what you can do is you can right click on the override section to bring up all the possibilities for this color. So if we want color not visible, for example, it becomes invisible. If we want to add a new RGB value, we can click on that and then use the color picker to select a whole new color and it'll turn into that color without affecting the original palette. Um, you can also have a texture override uh, the color that you see. Um, and you do this by clicking in the zone, which brings up a browser window and you can look for a texture. And let's choose the green leopard fur so it looks like that. You can open that up. And then if you change the override to texture, original matrix, or any of these for that fact that say texture, 
you see that swatch now appear as the fill. Um, and of course there are multiple options uh, depending on how you want to place uh, this textured fill or for the color override if you want to include the alpha or not. There are uh, several um, options for that as well. So this is really just how it's placed inside this area. So let me get rid of that. Um, and lastly there's a section here, selected colors. So um, if you drag and drop colors into this section, you can choose to render these colors only. And one of the uses for that is uh, actually for the glow effect that I just showed you. Um, for example, what if I just want the inside color of the carrot stars and fists to glow but not their outlines? Well, then I can put things like the carrot color fill, uh, the leaf color fill, the skin that's not a line, uh, and the star color inside this section and then say render selected colors only and then of course we have to hook the stars carrots and fist layer to the color override I think I'm actually going to unhook the other two from the color override the karate mask and the fighting cloud just so we can only see the stars carrots and fists connected to the color override um, and then on top of that what we need to do is add a glow so let's do that from our Add Layer button. We go to Effects, Glow. So I'm going to hook the color override to the glow. And then I'm going to give this glow the same parameters as the glow above, which is a radius of 4.5 and to use the source color as the matte. So let's do that. And the one last thing we have to do is you can see the glow up here here. We actually need to put a solid copy um, behind so that the glow appears in front. So we're going to take the stars, carrots, and fist layer, uh, right click on it and select duplicate selected layer. Uh, it also remains attached to the color override so we have to actually drag it out of the color override. And there we go. So the two things that we're looking at here is the glow one which is just the interior glow with the outline uh, not having a glow and then if we uncheck that as well as the uh, the solid layer that's on top um, and we check the other glow we can see that the entire uh, image is glowing so the outline included. So you have to keep that solid matte, which is this one right here underneath the fighting cloud, you have to keep the solid matte um, visible at all times so you can see the difference. So let's look at that one more time. So this is the interior glow and this is the full glow. And so that's what another use of the color override is to make that distinction in case you want to section a part of your drawing and just have that area an effect applied to that area like a mat. So the last thing I want to show you how to do is how to add brightness and contrast, the brightness and contrast effect um, to your scene. So in this case we have the fighting cloud which is a pretty uh, you know, it's not a vibrant color, it's pretty neutral beiges. So if we wanted to, you know, pump up the, the contrast a bit so that we can separate it from its background, we could do this easily by adding the brightness and contrast effect. So once again, I'll go to effect and brightness and contrast is the one at the top. So what I'm going to do is take the fighting cloud and drag and drop it over the brightness and contrast and then double click on the brightness and contrast effect to bring up its layer properties um, and then we're going to pump up the brightness and contrast by quite a bit so that it's quite obvious in the camera view, well maybe not that much. There we go. So by making this brighter and the contrast quite a bit heavier, what you can do is try to separate this element 
um, so that it stands out a little bit more from the background. Um, and you can actually do this in the negative way too. If you have a negative brightness, um, obviously it'll make it darker instead of brighter, so you can work both ways until you feel like it stands out a little bit better um, than it did before. So maybe something like that. So now let's try these effects in Animate Pro. So I'm just going to minimize this window here and we're going to open a new scene in Animate Pro. So let's save. Okay, let's open Sample Material Pack 16. Okay, so let's go to the network view as usual and let's look at what elements are missing. So all this stuff needs to be hooked onto uh, our composite. So let's just cut them by using Commander Control X, going back to our group and pasting them somewhere here where we can see them. I'm just gonna expand this for a minute. and what's out here too. Okay. okay, so these two we don't need. These two are the sketches, so I'm going to delete these. And then let's just hook these to the front of our uh, composite. We can always move them later, so I think that looks okay. You can use Command or Control F uh, to go from full screen back to uh, the regular interface. So what we'd like to add here, of course, is a, our glow effect, and we're going to add it to the uh, stars, carrots, and fists once again. So our glow should be in the filter tab, among other tabs. Um, and once again, we're going to hold down Alt and drag it across the cable. And if we remember from what we just learned in Animate, we need two copies. We need uh, the copy with the glow and we need a solid copy um, that you could put either in front or behind. So I'm gonna put it behind actually. I don't know if you can see what I'm doing, but this is the glow cable and this is the uh, solid copy. So let's scroll to a place in the timeline where we can actually see one of the carrots. Um, and of course it's not glowing yet because we haven't changed the parameters of the glow. So let's give it a radius. I think we had 4.5 last time and we used the source color. So there we have it. It's glowing and it looks really good. Um, if you get rid of the solid copy, which is this one right here, you're just going to see a glow without any uh, of the outline or the original fill color. So let's undo that again to put that back. So that's how you would add your basic glow. But let's look at the color override one more time. So that we can also find in the filter tab and the all tab as well. So we'll drag and drop that. Then if you recall from the animate tutorial, uh, we hooked it to the fighting clouds. Let's do that by holding down alt once again. Um, and then let's go into its layer properties. So we see all the palettes in our scene here. However, if there are a few that are missing, um, you can always click on this palette button to uh, shop for palettes that exist at different levels in the environment, job, or elements. So in this case, uh, there's only palettes in our scene and element uh, levels. And once again, you can find these to the back end of your project file. There is an environment folder, a job folder, a scene folder, and an element folder. Uh, so that's how you would access those. Uh, if we want to add an extra palette from a different scene or a different project, you can click on this folder button. Uh, let's choose the text uh, palette from, I'm not even sure, we're, we're in pack six. So we, were, we went to the palette library for this uh, project, Animate Pro uh, pack six, and we chose the text palette. So it now appears in our palette list, and if we click on it, we can see the colors in that palette. The next thing we took a look at 
uh, were the options on the right hand side, which is the palette override being the first. And we looked at the clone palette of the rabbit palette. So the rabbit palette is the original palette. In one of the previous tutorials, we made a clone of it, giving it nightshades uh, associated with all the pre-existing colors. Um, and we know that if we render the scene, the project will always consider the rabbit palette to be the palette that should be rendered. However, if we then take the cloned palette, the night palette, and put it in the palette override field, and of course we also have to hook the color override to the Karate Master. So let's do that. As we do here, uh, we have to also enable the Karate Master, and you can do that by selecting the module in the network view and hitting A to enable. Um, and if we still don't see anything because the cloud is in the way, we can choose the fighting cloud and hit D to disable so that it disappears from view. And let's see what's going on with our karate group here. Okay, so it's because the group's peg and drawing elements are not visible. So then if we zoom in, we can see that this is being rendered in nightshades. However, if we delete the rabbit night, the karate rabbit will be rendered using the original uh, karate rabbit palette. So that's what the palette override is for. Um, let's go back to our fighting cloud. So I'm going to take this off again and hook it back to the fighting cloud. I'm going to re-enable this by hitting A and I'm going to disable this by hitting D. And let's zoom out again. I'm going to hit Shift M to reset the view. And we're going to look at the color overrides. So the first thing we need to do is put some type of a color in there. So we want to go to our fighting cloud palette and let's take the fill one more time of the cloud. And then we have to decide what we want to do with this color. And so if we right click, or in this case, I think you can just click uh, on the override section, you can decide you don't want the color visible. It makes it invisible, for example. Um, you can decide that you want to add a texture. So I just clicked in that blank field under texture. Um, and then if we go back to gathering content, oh, if we go one more level higher, we go to building content textures. Uh, we can choose the exact same file, the, the green leopard fur and say open. And then we also have to change the override type once more to one of these texture options. So if we just use the original matrix, it looks like this. That's how it's mapped inside the area of the fighting cloud. But once again, you can decide to you know, map it any way that you choose by playing with those different options. Um, we can also decide to change the color without changing the original color. So we can do that by first choosing new RGBA, for example, and then clicking on this eyedropper to bring up the color picker window, picking something crazy like a fuchsia. And we can see that although the fighting cloud is now fuchsia in our render view mode, the actual palette color has not been disturbed. So it remains as that kind of pale uh, cream color. So let's just delete that from our list. And lastly, we have the selected colors region, and this is where we used the interior color of the uh, carrot, fist, and star uh, to render only those colors so that we can use those interior colors as a mat for the glow effect. So let's try doing that one more time as well. So we want the carrot, the carrot leaf, the skin color, and the star color there at the bottom. We want to render selected colors only and then of course right now we have the fighting cloud attached to the color override but what we want is the stars, clouds, and fists attached to the override. So let's grab that and let's hook it to, well we can do it right away, we can hook it above the glow which is what we want. So now you can see that the glow is contained inside the lines. So it's a lot faster than what we saw in Animate. 
let me just close this. We can see here that uh, without this, if we disable this, the glow goes beyond the outline because it's actually glowing from the outline group. But then if we enable the color override by hitting A, we decided in this color override just to render selected colors, which were all the fill colors. And so we have a copy going here of the regular drawing. So we do see an outline, but there's just no glow applied to it because the glow for this drawing element uh, is only taking this mat that is created by the color override. So that's how you would do that. So lastly, we wanted to take a look at the brightness and contrast. So I see it right here. Let's drop that in and let's put that over our fighting cloud. And let's click on the layer properties. And this time I won't go as far. So I think we had a negative contrast value. Is that it or the other way around? We might have had a negative brightness. You could do it like that too, or you could have a, a negative brightness and a positive contrast. Um, whichever you want until you get the look and feel that you're you're looking for but that's a pretty easy one to hook up to whichever drawing element you have um, in your network view okay so let's go back to animate so I can show you uh, the last two effects from the animate effect set so let's get animate again and let's open another new scene so let's save this one. And then this time let's open pack 18, um, which you may or may not recall was the morphing chapter. Okay, so once again, there's a few effects that are not applicable, um, but if we click on the play button, you can see the cloud that we morphed and it's pretty subtle, but so at the start, there are three humps. And then as we go along, they become two. Uh, these spirals change a little bit as does this shape right here. So the morph is pretty subtle, but it's there. Um, so let me just shorten the scene length. So it seems to stop at 60. And at least let's get the sky and maybe the mountains so we have a little bit of a background. Something like that. Okay. So the last two effects that I would like to talk to you about are the transparency effect and the mask or cutter effect. It's called a mask in Animate and a cutter in Animate Pro. So let's start with the transparency effect. I'm going to go into um, our effects once more and select transparency. And let's find our cloud and bring it to the top and then drop it over the transparency, thus parenting it. Let's also go into the render mode so any changes we make are visible. So it looks like the transparency effect already has some settings um, at work. We can verify this by double clicking on the layer to bring up the layer properties and we can see that the transparency is at 50. So we already know that it's uh, 50% of what it once wants. So 100% transparency is obviously 0% opaque. Um, and the opposite is true. So zero transparency is 100% opaque. Um, and once again, this is another effect that you could always animate over time. For example, you might have a character that's supposed to be a ghost and you would like to see it fade out over time. But it works nicely with atmospheric effects uh, such as clouds or water, things that are semi-transparent or can have transparency. So the last effect I'd like to show you is the mask effect. So this can be used in several ways. You can use the mask effect to make part of a solid invisible. You can also use it to create a hole. For example, like if you wanted this cloud to disappear into a black hole, you could paint a black hole, give it a mask, and as it passes through, on the other side it would disappear. So let's use one of those two concepts with the mask effect. So the mask effect has a mask, which is the area by which your drawing layer will disappear. So if our drawing layer is the cloud, we can attach that entire 
layer with its effect on top of the mask. And then for the mask layer, let's add a new drawing layer and let's name it mask matte. And then let's go into the drawing view and let's use a light table. So you see the cloud is here and let's say we want it to disappear into a hole that's about over here. So I'll take uh, my paintbrush, I'll keep it on black. Uh, let's say there's a hole like this. I'll fill that in. Like that. So that's the actual hole we'll have in our drawing. Um, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate this layer. And I'll use the underscore one as the actual mask mat. Whereas this mask mat is just there uh, as an actual drawing object in the scene. So the actual mask mat, I'm going to extend like this. So the entire cloud disappears beyond it. Something like that. So then if we go back to the camera view, you can see both of them are gone. I think it's because I hid this mask mat. I'm just going to drag it to the top to be sure that's not parented to anything. There we go. So it was parented. So now as the cloud passes through this black hole, um, we're going to see it disappear. Oh, I have to extend, of course, both the mask mat and the actual drawing object. And it obviously does not go down far enough, so let's go back into the drawing view. I'm just going to paint it a little bit further down. Okay, and there we go. So we see it disappearing, basically, behind this black hole. To actually make it look more realistic, what we can do is go back to the mask mat, which is the layer we're on. And do this so it won't start disappearing till it's at least halfway into the hole. If we put the actual drawing object beneath, like that. So now it's going to start passing through and go into the hole. There we go. So it's disappearing into this hole. Um, I don't know if you understood everything I did, so let me just go over it one more time. So we have our mask effect, and to our mask effect, we have the cloud hooked onto it. So we drag and drop the cloud on top of the mask. The cloud happens to be attached to a transparency effect. So whether this transparency effect was attached to the cloud or not, it doesn't matter. Um, we just dragged the entire group on top of the mask. Then for the mask's mask, or otherwise known as a mat, uh, we used a drawing object that looked like this which means that as soon as the cloud, which is the top attached to the mask, hits this mask uh, or mat, it'll start to disappear behind it. Um, and then to make the effect look real, we actually added a drawing object, this guy right here, which is a black circle. So the black circle sits behind it, both in the layer stack and in the camera view. It's almost like the cloud is passing between two pieces of paper. This is the, the paper behind the cloud. Um, this is the paper in front of the cloud, but because it's hooked to a mask effect in the camera view, you won't see it or anything that passes behind. So now let's go to Animate Pro and take a look at the same effects. So once again, we're going to open a new scene and we'll save it changes to our old one. So this time we're looking for pack 18, but for Animate Pro. Okay, so let's enable the same layers that we had in Animate. That's the mountains and the sky. And let's take a look at our network view to make sure everything looks good. Seems like everything's okay. So 
Let's look for our transparency effect. And let's hook it on to our cloud. And if we go to the render view mode, once again, it's already at 50%. So it's already 50% transparent or semi-transparent. Now let's take a look at the cutter effect. So um, once again, the cutter is the exact same thing as the mask. So it's not a filter. So let's just go to our all tab for sure it'll be in here. So it's this one right here. And what we're going to do is we're going to put it under the transparency, uh, but on in the right port because the left port is for the mat. Like that. And then we need a new drawing layer for our mat. Okay, so it's sort of hooked to the transparency effect. I'm not sure why, maybe I had it selected when I hit the create new drawing button. So let's leave it like this, hooked to the composite so that we're able to see it in our camera and drawing view. So let's go to our drawing view. We're on the correct layer, the drawing layer. Let's go to frame one. Uh, let's use the light table so we can see where the cloud is. Uh, let's use our paintbrush, or maybe even this time, maybe we can make a nice perfect ellipse. Uh, by doing this, filling it with black. In this case, we need two separate layers because it's not going to be a duplicate. One layer will actually look like this and one will look like the other mask that I showed you. So we can duplicate this at least as a start. I'm going to name this black hole. I'm going to right click on it and duplicate it. And instead of naming this black hole one, let's name this cutter mat. And so for the black hole, let's extend it at least up until frame 60. And we'll do the same thing for the cutter mat. I'm going to hide the black hole so I don't get confused. I'm on the cutter mat layer, which is correct. And now I'm going to extend the mat like that and fill it in and then I think we decided that we want to see at least half the hole as well like that okay so let's go back to our network view here our black hole let's enable it by hitting the letter A now that it's been selected in the network view uh, so we can leave that there actually want to put it behind the cloud there we go since it's behind um, and we want to put the cutter mat into the left port of the cutter effect like that so now if we go to the camera view and we drag our playhead across we see that as soon as the cloud hits that mat or mask, those two words are interchangeable, it starts disappearing behind it. Like that. So there's one thing that I forgot to show you in Animate, but I assure you it works the same in both Animate and Animate Pro, and that's um, working with the layer properties of the cutter effect. So I'm going to click on this little yellow box here, um, and the main or only uh, layer property that you can change is that you can invert your mat. So let's do that. And so basically what happens is you get the opposite effect. Now we can see the cloud as it passes uh, on the right side of the hole as opposed to uh, seeing it on the left. So on the left side it's completely invisible and then it slowly comes out. And I hope you understand why that's happening. Um, it's because our mat, which looks like this, has been inverted so really now the mat is everything but this black. This black is now the one place where you can see the cloud instead of the one place where the cloud will be hidden. So uh, that's what would happen when you invert a mat. So that's how you use the cutter effect in Animate Pro and it's the last uh, effect that I wanted to show you.
So that's it for the tutorial creating basic effects part two. Stay tuned for the next tutorial playing back effects.